all right guys so if you haven't seen part one um i would definitely uh encourage you to watch that one first before you watch this so you're caught up to speed and you understand everything okay but um this is gonna be the best part where uh, he goes into uh, what is actually most likely wrong with uh, Mr. Ramirez here and uh, all all his crazy illnesses. So uh, buckle your seat belts and get ready. Here we go. February 29th would be ironic though. This is the rarest birthday somebody could have, leap day. And it's, again, an ironic circumstance for somebody who did not fit into any known category of serial killer. Yeah, he was born on a, on leap year, uh, February, February 29th. That is a uh, very rare. And to be honest, um, it's a tragedy that he was even born, you know? I mean, look look at all the chaos he caused while he was alive, right? And all the lives he destroyed. At that time, Ramirez was the youngest of five children. It was thought that his mother was exposed to toxic chemicals when she was pregnant. 1962, so when he was two years old, we see that Ramirez was climbing up a dresser and it fell over and he was knocked unconscious for 15 minutes and required 30 stitches. 1965. He was hit on the head with a swing and again, knocked unconscious. 1966, he started having seizures. He was diagnosed with temporal lobe epilepsy. Okay, so all these hits to the head at a young age, right? Uh, I'm sure that played some kind of role in, in what happened later on in life. I mean, it couldn't have done anything positive to his brain, right? During the same year, he saw his father physically assault his oldest brother. In 1969, we see that he's described as a loner. He's characterized as being shy. Now, this connects with this theory that some have had that he might have had schizoid personality disorder, and I'll talk about that in a few moments. 1970, so 10 years old, he started using marijuana. The same year, he started to sleep in the cemetery to escape his father's uncontrolled anger. Sleep in the cemetery. And real quick, I mean, I know he's going over all this stuff that happened to him in his early life. And, um, of course, it's sad. But I, I don't want to, you know, in no way at all does this uh, mitigate or, or lessen uh, what he did, right? He murdered all these people in cold blood in the worst way imaginable. Assaulted wives in front of their husbands while they were dying. Pulled people out of their cars and shot them in the head, right? And then didn't even take the car. Drew pentagrams on the walls in his victim's blood, right? I mean, so don't, start feeling sorry for this guy 1972 he started spending time with his older cousin mike now mike was a vietnam war veteran and he started showing ramirez photographs of women who mike had assaulted during the war evidently these photographs were appealing to ramirez that couldn't the same help, year he right? threw a rock through a neighbor's window and his mother dismissed the incident so there were no consequences for that this moves us to May 4, 1973. We see that Ramirez and his older cousin Mike are together, and Mike kills his wife, Jessie. He shot her in the face with a 38 caliber revolver. So again, this happened in front of Ramirez. So we can see how this behavior connects to some of the behaviors that Ramirez demonstrated in the future. No wonder he didn't care now, about Now, Mike was killing. tried for the murder, but he was found not guilty by reason of insanity. He was released from the Texas State Mental Hospital in 1977. Also in 1973, we see that Ramirez had some learning experiences. His brother Ruben taught him how to open windows from the outside, pick locks, and disable alarm systems. So we got, we got his uh, in, literally insane uh, uh, brother that is 
killing people in front of him, right? And then we got his cousin that's teaching him how to pick locks and do all this crap, right? So he's learning all this stuff at an early age, right? And and developing uh, no feelings for anybody whatsoever, right? He also moved in with his sister and her husband. From 1973 to 1977, we see a number of unusual behaviors. Ramirez starts regularly committing burglaries. His experience with substance use graduates to hallucinogens. So not just marijuana, he adds hallucinogens, and later he adds cocaine and heroin. He starts going on dates with prostitutes. He gets a job at a local hotel at age 15. Yeah, that's that's a good uh, cocktail, right? Uh, every drug you can possibly imagine, and then I uh, start hanging out uh, with prostitutes all the time, combined with everything else, right? Now, when he had this job, he entered a room and started assaulting a female guest. That woman's husband entered the room and severely beat Ramirez. The couple, of course was from a different location that's why they were staying in a hotel another, another head and they injury. left and they would not come back to testify against ramirez so we see a massive missed opportunity to stop his behavior now he had some other crimes he had committed and was convicted of so he was sent to a juvenile detention camp yeah who knows what would have happened if if they would have came back and, and testified against uh, him for assaulting a, a, uh, that guy's wife right he would have been in, put in jail after being released from this camp, he skipped school and his grades dropped. He dropped out of high school at age 17. This brings us to 1977. As I mentioned, his older cousin Mike was released from the hospital this year. Mike and Ramirez resumed spending time together. By the time he was age 18, we see that Ramirez was worshiping Satan. From 1978 to 1984, Ramirez was arrested several times for auto theft, stealing other items, burglary, and possession. Worshiping in 1979, Satan. he gives up on personal hygiene altogether. In 1983, and that's what I was saying. He he gives up on personal hygiene, right? So people could smell him from 10, 20 feet away, right? I mean, uh, I saw on another video, and one of the survivors uh, was smelt something horrible, and then uh, about a minute later, there's Ramirez. Three, he tells a relative that Satan was protecting him. And of course, after this, we see he starts committing the murders. So now moving to his mental health and personality. Now, the most obvious alignment when looking at Ramirez would be antisocial personality disorder. With this disorder, we see seven symptom criteria. Here we see repeated unlawful behaviors, consistent deceitfulness, impulsivity, aggression, a reckless disregard for safety, irresponsibility, and a lack of remorse. So only three symptoms are required for somebody to have a diagnosis of this disorder. So he's got six or seven and only three are required for this disorder. Wow. We see here that all seven symptoms appear to align with the behavior of Ramirez. Now antisocial personality disorder has a strong relationship with factor two psychopathy. This is also called secondary psychopathy or sociopathy. The behavior of Ramirez appears to align with almost every characteristic of factor two psychopathy. This would include excitement seeking, a parasitic lifestyle, a lack of long-term goals, impulsivity and irresponsibility, poor behavioral controls, early behavioral problems, juvenile delinquency, and criminal versatility. So he was exceptionally versatile as a criminal. He would steal cars, sell substances, he committed murder, assault, burglary, theft. So he, had he did everything. Everything uh, illegal, he was doing. A lot of different criminal capabilities. Now, the last characteristic of factor two psychopathy is a revocation of conditional release. I couldn't find the evidence that this happened, but it makes sense that this could have happened. Like clearly, if he was released, like on probation or parole, it makes sense that he would have violated that. So that's why I said almost every characteristic from factor two psychopathy, because I can't verify the revocation of conditional release. Now with Ramirez, there's also a significant- Yeah, well, do any of you guys think if if he was put on uh, probation or parole, 
he wouldn't, uh, he would just all of a sudden uh, not break any of the things that he's been doing his whole life, right? Not break any laws, right? Not do any drugs, because you can't do any kind of drugs when you're on probation or parole, right? Uh, hello, I don't think so. Overlap with factor one psychopathy, primary psychopathy. We see a lack of remorse or guilt, shallow affect, being callous, so having a lack of empathy, a failure to accept responsibility, pathological lying, and grandiosity. The only mm. two that don't seem to fit here would be superficial charm and being manipulative. Both of those really have some subtlety aspect to them, and we see that Ramirez was not subtle. And this is the main reason why I chose Dr. Grande, his video on uh, Richard Ramirez to react to because of his knowledge of all these things that are going on with his brain so we can better understand uh, why he's doing all this crap or did all this, right? Either way, the alignment with both types of psychopathy appears to be pronounced. This is why sometimes Ramirez is thought of as a pure psychopath because he has almost all of the characteristics from both types of psychopathy. So this brings me to narcissistic personality disorder. Many have suspected that Ramirez was narcissistic. Well, because he has so many characteristics of psychopathy, we would expect him to be narcissistic. But if we look at the official personality disorder, we see okay alignment, but not perfect alignment. So looking at the symptoms that align, we see grandiosity, believing oneself to be special or unique, requiring excessive admiration. This was more after he was already in prison a sense of entitlement and lacking empathy. The criteria... I, of course he lacks empathy, right? If you can uh, just uh, murder and assault people and while they're looking you right in the eyes and begging for you to stop, right? You're, you have no heart, you have no empathy at all, and you don't care whatsoever. That is the scariest type of person on on earth, right? I mean, even even uh, Jeffrey Dahmer, right? He he, uh, he had love for his grandmother, right? Um, that's that's just why Ramirez is is the scariest person that I I've researched, in my opinion that he doesn't really seem to align with would be the fantasies of success and power. He may have had those, but it's not clear. Being manipulative, as I talked about before, it's psychopathy. We see that envy is a characteristic. This one isn't clear. And being arrogant isn't clear. A case could be made for an alignment with NPD. Again, the symptoms were more prevalent after his arrest, but a much better case could be made for antisocial personality disorder. And NPD, narcissistic personality disorder. In case anybody was wondering. Psychopathy. I've also seen this argument that Ramirez had schizoid personality features or the disorder. I talked about this before. Let's take a look at that. Schizoid personality disorder is a cluster A personality disorder. It's in the odd eccentric cluster. And we see that there are seven symptom criteria. So let's see how the behavior of Ramirez may or may not align with these symptoms. The first symptom, neither desires nor enjoys close relationships including being part of a family. I think a case could be made for this one. The next symptom, almost always chooses solitary activities. During the time when he was committing murders, he would steal cars, he would buy substances and use them. He was mostly engaging in solitary activity, but it's not clear if he was that way before that. Next symptom, has little, if any, interest in having sexual experiences with other people. This one he does not meet. Next one. Yeah, well... So he doesn't have any friends. I mean, uh, he's not having. Well, he's only ha he's only having sex with prostitutes, right? I don't know if does that even count. Um, you know, because obviously the prostitutes don't care about him, right? And takes pleasure in few, if any, activities. Well, it's not clear. I mean, he probably did get some pleasure out of some activities. So. Yeah, killing people, stealing people's cars, right? 
uh, stabbing people. Yeah, he got pleasure out of those activities. I don't think he meets this one either. Next, we have lacks close friends or confidants other than first degree relatives. This one he may meet. This one, I think a better case can be made for than some of the others. Then we see appears indifferent to praise or criticism of others. I don't think he meets this one. And the last one is shows emotional coldness, detachment, or flattened affect. I think this one is certainly a possibility. So he does appear to have some schizoid features, and he may even qualify as having enough for the disorder, but I really don't see Ramirez as, as schizoid. I think a better argument could be made that he's really just quite shy, right? He was a loner, but being a loner doesn't mean schizoid necessarily. Now, some people believe that Ramirez was psychotic, like he was having a mystical delusion. He believed Satan was protecting him, and he had a lot of other unusual beliefs in that same area. It's possible that he could have had something like delusional disorder. It's hard to know for sure. He used substances so heavily and for so long that this could have caused cognitive processing difficulties that could have been mistaken for psychosis. Yeah. That co all those drugs he was using, that cocktail of drugs, I mean, who knows what he was really like when he, when he was actually completely sober, right? Because he probably was never sober, right? I mean, on, uh, you have to go way back probably until he was like uh, 13 or before until he was completely sober, right? So, as an adult, uh, nobody really knows exactly how he really was without being on a whole bunch of shit, right? So that takes care of the mental health factors. What about personality? So using the five-factor model, I remember the five factors to the acronym ocean. ocean, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. I would say that Ramirez is probably high in openness to experience, he's extremely low in conscientiousness. I'm not sure you can get much lower than what he demonstrates here in his speech. Yeah, no conscience whatsoever. The lowest of the low. Behavior. We see low extroversion, probably extremely low as well, low agreeableness, and low in most facets of neuroticism, but not low in the angry hostility facet. So... Yeah, that, that's probably the highest of the high, right? But what makes Ramirez unusual, right? He's clearly different than a lot of other serial killers. What really stands out here? Well, as I mentioned before, there really wasn't a serial killer category that fit Ramirez when he was arrested. Mostly, he's labeled as a disorganized thrill killer who is also sadistic. When I listed all those offenses in the timeline, we see that he had contact with 14 victims that he did not kill, and likely had contact with many other victims as well, and he did not kill them. Now, he certainly tried to kill some of them, but with other victims, he let them live, even though he had a clear opportunity to kill them. So that's quite different than most serial killers. We I wonder why. I wonder why that is, right? Why do you guys think he didn't kill at least 14 people that he knew and... Uh, and was around, but didn't kill him, right? Uh, I don't really have an answer to that. I guess only only Richard uh, knows that, and he's dead, so. We see that Ramirez was particularly brutal. The judge that sentenced him to death said that his actions demonstrated cruelty, callousness, and viciousness beyond any human understanding. Yeah. Like I said, the, the worst I've ever seen. The damage that Ramirez caused cannot be measured by only the murders. His assaults also caused tremendous suffering. Many of the victims developed post-traumatic stress disorder or symptoms of that disorder. That's what I was saying in, my, in the first uh, video. I mean, the people, the survivors of this, I mean, they, the rest of their lives, they're, they're going to be haunted um, from what Ramirez did to them. I mean, it's just so sad. Only the murders. 
His assaults also caused tremendous suffering. Many of the victims developed post-traumatic stress disorder or symptoms of that disorder. We see that Ramirez did not wait for victims to come to him. He made entry into people's houses, sometimes breaking in, but most of the time entering through an unlocked or open window. Many serial killers stalk to some... It's just like Koberger, right? He, I mean, at night, just like Ramirez, I mean, Ramirez and Koberger, they would, at night, go and look in through the windows, right? They would see everybody's in their room, laying down, right? Nobody's up, there's no lights on, right? And then they would, uh check the windows or the doors and then if one's unlocked they go in they go in right because that way if it's much easier to kill somebody if you if you surprise them right just like brian koberger he surprised everybody why they were in bed right with no and with no weapons and by the time they see him even if they do have weapons, it's too late, right? If someone comes in and they have a gun pointed at you, or they just bust in and, and jump on top of you, it's too late, right? That's scary. So, guys, girls, lock your windows, lock your doors at all times, okay? This world is not a safe place. Some degree. So they follow victims or they wait for victims to kind of cross in front of them. Ramirez was very active in his pursuit. Kind of random though too. So he would pick a house, probably based on how easy it was to make entry. But he didn't have okay. victims in mind in advance. He didn't watch people for days. And he didn't stay put. He was mobile. And... Yeah, see, R Ramirez is just weird. He he just he just wanted to kill and assault people, right? He got enjoyment out of this. He worshipped Satan. Okay, so uh, you know we can't don't comment and say, oh well, uh, he did this so. Koberger uh, is innocent. He, this has nothing to do with Koberger, right? They, ju they just have some similarities that I was pointing out, okay? Um, but anyway, yeah. Ramirez, is he would just go, and if, if the door was unlocked, he would come in. And it, that's, that's what made him so hard to catch. It was just totally random, right? So the police... They had no idea where he was going to go because he didn't even know where he was going to go next, right? This really makes him quite a bit different, again, than a lot of the serial killers we see. Ramirez took a tremendous number of chances when he committed his crimes. Yeah. He was not particularly careful about evidence being left behind. But when he would steal automobiles, he would wipe down those vehicles to remove his fingerprints. Well, remember, and back back in the 80s when he was doing this, I mean, the the... DNA and in the, in the forensics was nowhere near what it is today. Okay, they didn't they didn't have genealogy st uh, websites that you could uh, look up and see if uh, a family member matches. They didn't have uh, any kind of you know. It was just a basic of the basic back then, right? There wasn't computers. There was you just you had to write everything down, right? That's just crazy. Although he missed at least one fingerprint, and that's what led to his arrest. Now, most serial killers tend to stick with the same method of killing their victims, but Ramirez used a wide variety of weapons. Just to name a few: a twenty-two caliber revolver, a twenty-five caliber automatic, various knives, a lamp, a hammer an electrical cord, a telephone cord, a machete, and a tire iron. He also punched and kicked victims as well. So he, had, he used whatever was around, right? Um, sometimes he, he had guns, right? And he even, if, if uh, he felt comfortable enough, if they were old or, or young and uh, not fighting, he, he used his fist, right? 
to kill someone with your fist, that must take forever, right? And you have to be one super sick individual to just keep punching somebody until they're dead. You know what I'm saying? He did not seem to have an age preference for his victims. This is also a bit unusual. Typically, yeah. serial killers do have a range that they're looking for. We see that stealing cash, jewelry, and other valuables was important to Ramirez. He used this money to fuel his substance use habit. We see Ramirez would commit murders one after the other and often commit more than one in the same morning. And remember, he was doing burglaries um, and his cousin was teaching him how to pick locks and do burglaries way before he started murdering people. So he was comfortable already just going in houses and, and stealing stuff because he had to um, or he would get sick because he needed the drugs, right? So not just more than one homicide, but more than one location. So we see a lot of energy and a lot of rage here. The last unusual characteristic of Ramirez that I'll cover here is that he actually lived through this crime spree. He was sneaking in or breaking into people's homes. It was common knowledge that he was on the loose. We saw that gun sales increased dramatically during the time when he was active. And yet many people left their windows unlocked or open and no one was able to engage him with a loaded firearm during the commission of his crimes. Yeah, remember we, in the first video, somebody had a shotgun, but it wasn't loaded. So, it, she could have stopped a lot of these killings if her gun was loaded. And, you know, that's that's a shame, right? And these all these people that lived around this area knew that he was committing these murders and burglaries and still left their windows open and their doors unlocked. I, I can't comprehend that, right? I mean, even, even if there's... I keep my doors locked all the time. And there's no serial killer that I'm aware of around where I live, right? And everybody should do the same thing, right? You never know when there's some psycho that's just going to try and open your door, right? So... He was just kind of, again, randomly going from one place to the next, committing these vicious crimes. And one last thing, for, for all if all you that, that don't believe uh, that people should have firearms, the bad guys, like, like uh, Richard, have guns, right? So, let, let me ask you, that you guys that, uh, that don't like uh, civilians uh, owning guns... Um, what are what are people supposed to do uh, if when someone uh, breaks in your house and has a gun? You're supposed to call, call the cops, right? They're, that's going to take five to ten minutes. You don't have that long, okay? You don't have that long. So, so you guys, those of you that don't believe uh, people that should have or own guns, I want you to comment below. And tell me, um, what are you supposed to do in that situation when someone breaks into your house and has a gun? Uh, what would you do? And well, what are you supposed to do? Right? If you're in your bedroom, you can't. What do you? You can't run anywhere if, if he's standing right in the door with a gun, right? So what are you supposed to do? There was not one occasion that somebody was able to stop him. What's interesting about... I'll tell you one thing. I mean, nobody's taken my life with a gun with without a fight, right? Without, without me uh, firing back, right? I mean, come on. The way he committed the crimes was, for the most part, he would make entry into the house and then survey the situation. So he'd walk from room to room. He would try to see everyone who was in the house, like if there was any children in the house 
or whoever else might be there, he wanted to know that before he started his attack. So if people had like alarm systems or a dog or something like that, they may have detected his presence and they could have engaged him if they had a weapon. Now, if I had to guess, though, I would say that Ramirez actively avoided houses with alarm systems and dogs, and this might explain why nobody was able to engage him and stop him. So bringing everything together, what do I think happened with Ramirez? How did he become this way? Well, he was exposed to a number of negative elements. And I know this happens to a lot of people, but with Ramirez, what really stands out is just how young he was when these factors started influencing him. We see toxic chemicals in utero, the concussions at age two and age five, using marijuana at age 10, the disturbing photographs and stories from his older cousin Mike at age 12, witnessing a homicide at age 13, it seems like he just didn't have a chance. If one factor didn't cause trouble for him, another factor would have. And on top of all this, of course, we see the substance use just added fuel to the fire, and that behavior escalated quite dramatically through his criminal career. But none, none of that excuses or mitigates anything that he's done, okay? Uh, there is uh, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people that have uh, gone through similar experiences and we're not talking about them, right? They haven't uh, murdered or assaulted uh, people like this, right? So, uh, you know, yeah, it's a sad case, uh, but um, he did what he did, you know? The story of Ramirez is a story of missed opportunities. There are many factors here that could have been recognized and an intervention could have taken place to prevent the crimes from occurring later on. But all these things kept happening, all these factors, his criminal activity when he was younger, again, the substance use, all these different factors, and no meaningful intervention ever occurred. All right, guys. Well, that's it. Uh, hope you uh, learned something. Um, keep your doors and your windows locked. And I would suggest having or owning at least one weapon, a uh, firearm. That's my personal opinion. Get mad at me if you want. But I'm trying to save your life. But until next time, True Crime King, out.